Hello, church family. It is such a blessing that I can share the word with you today via YouTube. And so I pray today that this word will bless you, will encourage you, will challenge you, will inspire you, and will grow you in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we look at God's word together, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can share your word today and grow in it today. I pray, Lord, that this word will travel, Lord, and touch and bless and encourage your people today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of my message today is How to Handle Criticism. How to Handle Criticism. A man once came up to D.O. Moody and criticized him for the way he went about winning souls for Jesus. Moody listened courteously, then asked, how would you do it? The man, taken aback, mumbled that he didn't do it. Well, said Moody, I prefer the way I do it to the way you don't do it. In life, we all face criticism from time to time. There have been times that we have been the victims of criticism, and there also have been times where we have criticized others. In fact, handling criticism can be very hard to do. In fact, if criticism is not handled well, it can tear a person apart. It can discourage them, and it can even demoralize them. And so today, I want to turn your attention to what the Bible has to say about criticism. Yes, beloved, the Bible has plenty to say about criticism. In fact, we want to look at these three questions today and provide answers to these three questions. The first question is, what does the Bible have to say about criticism? The second question is, when we are criticizing others, what are the measures we should use scripturally? And then the third question, which I believe is important and relevant for us today, and that is, how do we deal with criticism? Yes, in life, you and I will be criticized, and so it is important to know how to deal with criticism in a godly way. And so before we look at our main passage in Nehemiah chapter 4, I would like to provide a brief recap of the first three chapters in Nehemiah. In chapter 1, we see that Nehemiah is burdened to leave Persia to go back home to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. King Artaxerxes grants Nehemiah his request and gives him the necessary tools to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. In chapter 2, we see that Nehemiah leaves Persia. He goes back home to Jerusalem, and he begins to share his vision with the people and how God has inspired him and the people to rebuild the walls once again. And then in chapter 3, we see that the people are excited, and they rally behind Nehemiah, and they begin to build the walls. Now we look at chapter 4, and this is where we pick up. Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. It says, now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and in the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? And Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, yes, what Yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, will it break down their stone wall? For some context here, Sam Ballot and Tobiah, they were considered to be enemies of the Jews who they had made several attempts to try to stop Nehemiah and the people from rebuilding the walls. And so we see here that there is some opposition between Sam Ballot and Nehemiah and the people rebuilding the walls. And you're probably thinking to yourself, and looking at the first three verses in Nehemiah chapter 4, why would Sanballat be so bothered by the fact that Nehemiah and the people are rebuilding the walls? Well, for some context here, Sanballat was the governor over Samaria. And now that he sees that these Jews are beginning to come in, and they are building something special for the Lord, and it's these walls they are beginning to rebuild. And so he notices three things in them rebuilding these walls. The first thing he notices 
is that the Jews are getting stronger. They're getting stronger in their commitment to the work of the Lord, but also they're getting stronger in their size. And because they're getting stronger in their size, the second thing he notices is that that he will not be able to control Jerusalem. And then the third thing he notices is that these Jews who are growing stronger in size and their commitment to the Lord, he notices that, and, and actually he feels, should I say, that they will soon take over his territory. And so thinking about this, beloved, we have to see here when it comes to Sam Ballot on why he's so bothered. He's so bothered because Nehemiah and the people are going to commit to working for the Lord and nothing he sees is going to stop them. And so we can see that Sam Ballot, he feels insecure and he feels threatened by the work that Nehemiah and the people are doing. So now the question comes to mind, if Sam Ballot feels threatened and he feels insecure and what is happening with Nehemiah and the people and building these walls, the question comes in is this, how does Sam Ballot respond to Nehemiah and the people? Well, Sam Ballot responds to Nehemiah and the people, he lashes out at them with criticism. Look at what the Bible has to say in Nehemiah chapter four, verse one. Now, when Sam Ballot heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. So the key word here in verse one is jeered. Jeered means to mock. It means to heckle. It means to ridicule. It means to even criticize. And what we see here in verse one is that Sam Ballot is the leading criticizer. We're going to see in a moment that he brings someone else along to help him in the criticizing. But what we see here in verse 1 is that Sam Ballot is the leading criticizer. Verse 2, look at verse 2 with me. In verse 2, and he said in the presence of his brothers and in the army of Samaria. And so what I want you to see here, beloved, in verse 2 is that it wasn't only good enough for Sam Ballot to leading to, to lead out in criticizing Nehemiah and the people, but he feels that it's important to gather his brothers and the entire army to help criticize Nehemiah and the people. And so, beloved, there's an important point I want you to see here, and that is criticizers, and I mean criticizers who don't mean you will, criticizers will often recruit people to be on their team to help in the criticizing. I know you may have people in your life, or let's say that person in your life, who is criticizing you beyond measure, criticizing you unfairly, and the next thing you know is now they have gathered more people in their side to criticize you to see if it's going to have a negative impact on your life. And so what we see here is that Sam Ballot feels that, no, it's just not good enough for me to criticize Nehemiah and the people. But what I must do is I'm going to go gather some more people to be on my side to criticize Nehemiah and the people to see if it will have a negative impact on them, to see if I can get them to be discouraged in doing the work that they have said that God has called them to do. In fact, we see evidence of Sam Ballot criticizing Nehemiah and the people. And his criticism comes in five questions. Here's the first question of criticism by Sam Ballot. He says, what are these feeble Jews doing? That word feeble means to, it means weak. When you think of the word feeble, it means weak. So in other, in other words, Sam Ballot is saying, what are these weak Jews doing? He's questioning not only their emotional and their mental, but he's questioning their physical strength. The second question of criticism, he says, well, they restore it for themselves. That word restore means to complete, to build back again. He's questioning if they can actually build these walls again. The third question of criticism, he says, will they sacrifice? We know in life you and I have to sacrifice in order to accomplish the goals that we have set for ourselves. And he's saying, do they have what it takes to build the walls again? Will they sacrifice? The fourth question of criticism he gives to them is, will they finish it in a day? So in other words, he's saying, look, they may, they may take the rest of their lives to complete this project. And so he's questioning once again their sacrifice, their commitment. Do they have the expertise to finish this in a quick, timely manner? And then the fifth question of criticism he offers is, will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish 
and burn ones at that. In other words, he's saying, do they have the expertise? Are they competent enough? Are they creative enough to take those things that are on the ground and begin to mold it and to build a wall that will honor God? But not only, like I said, the Sanballat feel that he must criticize Nehemiah and the people, but he also sees that I need to bring some people with me to help criticize Nehemiah and the people. And he brings Tobiah along with him. And Tobiah was considered to be another uh, enemy of God's people. Tobiah says this in verse 3. He says, yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. In other words, Tobiah jumps in with criticism. And he says, even if the Jews can finish building this wall, this wall will be poorly constructed to the point that if an animal such as a fox would jump on the wall, it will come down. So he's saying, even if the wall was finished, even if they completed, should I say, it will not be what they had envisioned it to be. And so, beloved, I want to let you know today, when you work for the Lord, expect criticism. When you work for the Lord, expect criticism. In fact, when you are in the Lord's service, criticism is par for the course. If you look down through the pages of your Bible, there were plenty of people who were criticized. Moses was criticized. Every single chance the children of Israel got, they complained and they criticized his leadership. They, they questioned every direction he gave them. They criticized Moses beyond measure. Another person who was criticized in the Bible is Hezekiah, and that's found in Hezekiah chapter Hezekiah, that's found in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 28 and 35. We see Hezekiah was criticized. And then also, look at this one, Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus was criticized. And so that goes to show you and I that if our Lord and Savior was criticized by people of his day, you and I will be criticized for working for the Lord. When it comes to us working for the Lord, we cannot please everybody. Once again, when it comes to us working for the Lord, we can't please everybody. The Apostle Paul, he talks about this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. He says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to still please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. In other words, Paul says, look, I understand man is important, but God is more important. And so I'm going to honor God because I want to please God. Because I think Paul understands here that he can't please everybody. In life, you can't please everybody. And sometimes when you can't please everybody, you'll get criticized for not pleasing everybody. But Paul understands, no, I have a bigger goal in mind, and that is to please Christ, even if it means to displease man. Bill Cosby, a famous comedian, you know Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby says, I don't know the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. You cannot please everybody, beloved. So whenever you face criticism, there are four filters you need to take it through before you react and respond. Once again, when you are facing criticism, you need to take it through four filters before you react and respond. And here's the first filter you need to take it through. When you are being criticized, you need to ask yourself the question, what is the target of the criticism? What is the target of the criticism? In other words, you need to ask yourself a question, what is this person criticizing? Is it me or is it the mission in which God has called me to? Let me give an example of both. Let's say you are on your job and your boss calls you in his office and he says that, hey, I noticed that you've been doing a great job at work. You're on time, you're faithful to your assignment, and you are producing good results for the company. And so because of this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a raise and I'm also going to promote you. And word gets around to several of your coworkers, but one coworker in particular, particular that you're very close with, and this coworker you notice starts to treat you differently and starts to uh, harbor ill feelings against you and is jealous of you because they notice that you got that raise and promotion. And all of a sudden, they start to spread rumors about you and to start to say things about your character that is not true at all. 
Well, beloved, that is a form of personal criticism. Not only is it gossip, but it's also a form of personal criticism. But then also, there's a different kind of criticism, and that is the mission in which you've been called to. Let's say, for example, on that same job, you notice that your coworkers are participating in something that is not right, something that is ungodly, and something that is not professional on the job. And they look at you and they say, hey, look, this is what we're doing over here. We want you to participate in this with us. But you say, look, I can't join in with you on that because that is breaking company policy and that is not and also that is not honoring God that is not honoring what 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 I am trying to do here and to reflect Christ here on this job and then they look at you and they say what you think you're better than us you 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 think you're more holy than us why do you serve that God why are you trying to reflect Christ on this job God will understand he wants you to participate in this but you say no I want to honor God on this job and they mock you and they criticize you because of your faith you see, the first example, they were criticizing you because you got a raise and, and a promotion. But, and that's a form of personal criticism. But this one, they're criticizing you because you're standing firm on God's word. You're trying to reflect Jesus on your job, and you're trying to honor God on your job. And so they're mocking, they're ridiculing, or should I say in this case, they're criticizing the mission in which you've been called to by God. Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah knows the target of the criticism. So Nehemiah asks the same question. He says, what is the target of the criticism? Are they criticizing me or are they criticizing the mission in which God has called me to? And Nehemiah, he begins to understand. Listen, listen to this, beloved. He begins to understand that they're not criticizing me. Sam Ballard and Tobiah and the rest of the folk, they're not criticizing me. They're criticizing the mission in which I've been called to by God. Listen to what Nehemiah says in, in Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, and I'm reading this in the Message Bible version. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, now when Samballot, Tobiah, and Jesem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, and there were no more breaks in it, even though I hadn't yet installed the gates, Samballot, Jesem, sent this message. Come and meet with us at Kirifim in the valley of Anom. I knew they were scheming to hurt me, so I sent messengers back with this. I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. Why should the work come to a standstill just so I can come down to see you. Four times they sent this message and four times I gave them the same answer. In other words, Nehemiah understood they're not criticizing him. They're criticizing the mission in which he's been called to. And because he understood the targeted criticism was against the call on his life, he was able to stay on the wall. He was able to charge those to stay on the wall with him because anytime you're doing God's work, you will be criticized by those. You'll be criticized by people in your family. You'll be criticized by those on the job. And check this out. You will be sometimes even be criticized by people in church. You'll be criticized when everybody doesn't understand the call that God has given upon your life. And so our mission, beloved, the enemy, our greatest criticizer, he will criticize us day and night. He accuses us day and night before God. He criticizes us. He tries to distract us. He wants to discourage us. He wants to demoralize us with all sorts of criticism. But we, may, but we must stay focused because we are called to a greater purpose. We are called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to bring a lost and dying world into that relationship with Jesus Christ and to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to share how much he loves our world and how he died for them and how he wants to restore them back in relationship with our heavenly father. And so, beloved, we have to understand that, yes, we'll be criticized. And yes, in this case, the mission in which we've been called to will be criticized, but we have to stay focused on the job at hand. First, whenever you're facing criticism, you must ask yourself, what is the target of the criticism? Secondly, when you're facing criticism, you must consider the source of the criticism. Once again, you must consider the source of the criticism. In other words, you must ask yourself a question, who is the criticizer? 
Are they people you should listen to? Are they people you shouldn't listen to? Beloved, we have people in our life who we listen to. You know who those people are in your life. And then you have some people in your life that because of the advice that they give that's not always good or the counsel that that they give that's not always good, you choose not to listen to them. Also, are they criticizing this person who's criticizing me? Are they criticizing me because they want to help me or are they criticizing me because they want to hurt me? And when we're talking about criticism, there are really two forms of criticism. There's constructive criticism and then there is destructive criticism. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10. It says, but when Sam Ballot and the but when Sam bowed the whore and, and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. And then Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. It says, But when Sam bowed the whore and, and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Jesem the Arab heard it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. You see, once again, Sam, Ballot, and Tobiah, they were the enemies of the Jews who had made several attempts to try to stop Nehemiah and the people from rebuilding the walls. But here's the thing I need you to see, beloved, and that is Nehemiah considered the source of criticism. He knew that his criticism was coming from people who opposed God. They opposed God. So Nehemiah put two and two together. He said, well, if Sam, Ballot, and Tobiah and their crew are opposing God, of course they're going to oppose me. And what I want to let you know today, there may be people in your life who oppose God. So what makes you think that all of a sudden they're going to like you and they're going to give you praise? No, if there are people in your life, definitely in your family, or maybe on your job, or maybe in your neighborhood who oppose God, then more than likely it's a good percent that they're going to oppose you. If they scoff at God, if they criticize God and all that, all the good that God does, then they're going to criticize you. It's par for the course. Remember what Jesus said in his word. He said, look, if they hate and persecute me, what do you think they're going to do to you? Is a servant greater than his master? No. We are not greater than Jesus. We are his servants. And so how Jesus was treated, we will be treated in the same way. All for the glory of God. What I want you to see, in life, there are three categories of people who criticize us. There are three people in life who criticize us. Category number one, wise people. Or let me keep this scriptural here. Wise Christians, wise believers in the Lord will criticize us. And here's the thing with wise Christians. Wise people, or should I say wise Christians in this case, they have a lot to say, and we should listen to them. It doesn't mean that everything they say is right, but we should listen to them because wise people, wise Christians, yield his or her thinking and life to the word of God. Wise Christians are humble. Wise Christians are teachable. Wise Christians are open to correction themselves. And wise Christians, they always want the best for your life. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 5. It says, better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. And then Norman Vincent Peale, I love this quote by Norman Vincent Peale. He says, the trouble with most of us is that we would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. In other words, what that means is sometimes in life, we had those people who want to praise us and to tell us all the things we want to hear. And that's good in a sense, but in a sense, also, that's not good because we should have those people in our life who are going to tell us the truth and, and who's going to offer us constructive criticism, even if it hurts our feelings. And even though they're not intending to hurt our feelings, they want to make us better people. They want to make us better Christians. They want to make us better husbands and wives and fathers and brothers and, and, and great workers on our job. And so we need people in our life. And I would encourage you to keep those people in your life that are going to tell you the truth when everybody else may be telling you a lie. 
when you're facing criticism, ask yourself an important question. Are they trying to help me or hurt me? When we look at criticism, there are some scriptural standards of constructive criticism. Firstly, constructive criticism must be grounded in love, whether it's us receiving the criticism or, in this case more so, us giving the criticism to others. Constructive criticism must be grounded in love. That is so important because it doesn't matter what you say to the person. It may be true, but how you say it matters. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6, it says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, it says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And then we get to the love chapter here, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 7. It says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Did you know that love is all of those things? So, I want you to think about this. The next time you say that you love someone, think about these verses. Because this right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, this is the definition of love. And this is how we should communicate the truth. In love. Anonymous quote. An anonymous quote is said, honesty without love is cold, and love without honesty is shallow. Speak the truth with love. Secondly, constructive, criti constructive criticism must be grounded in the truth of God's word. And this, once again, this is the wise person. This is us who are, are mature in Christ. When we are offering constructive criticism to others, we must, it must be grounded in the truth of God's word because godly criticism is reflective of what the scripture is critical of. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in other words, beloved, these verses are saying that the inspired word of God leads Christians to analyze situations every day critically. In fact, we have to look at every situation in our life critically and examine it through the word of God. Thirdly, when criticizing others, you will be judged in the same manner. So in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged in that way as well. So watch how you judge. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. It says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, Others, you too will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And then what I want to do is I want to read that same chapter in two verses in the, in the Message Bible version. So Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 in the Message Bible version. It says, don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. The critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. If we are going to criticize or correct, we must do it in love, we must do it in scriptural ethics, and we must be truthful with what we are saying. Very important. So the first category we looked at was dealing with wise people criticizing. But now I want to look at the second category, category number two, which deals with fools who criticize. Fools who criticize. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 7. It says, stay away from a fool, for you will not find knowledge on their lips. How many have we heard people in our lives who don't have any knowledge on their lips? They're always spewing something that is pretty hurtful or something that is obnoxious. 
Proverbs chapter 23, verse 9, it says, Do not speak to fools, for they will scorn your prudent words. And then look at this verse. This verse is powerful, and I know it will resonate with you. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4. It says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Once again, th this is what this verse is saying. If you respond to a fool on his level, now you have just dropped down to his level and you're just acting just like him. But not only does category two deal with a fool, but it gives two specific kind of fools. The first kind of fool is an ignorant fool. An ignorant fool. And beloved, we must humbly accept and admit today, if we're honest, that all of us at one point or another have been an ignorant fool. Think about this. An ignorant fool, let me tell you what an ignorant fool is. An ignorant fool is one who criticizes others based off of what they heard and feel without verifying the facts first about another individual. We all have done that in life. And let me give, and let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's say you hear one of your friends criticizing another person. And, uh, and, and, and they're saying all kind of things about that other person that is not true. But you know that other person that your friend is criticizing. And you say, you know what, I need to pull my friend to the side and talk to him or talk to her. And you pull your friend to the side and say, hey, I, I take issue with some things you've said about that person because I know that person and the things that you're saying about them is not accurate. And you ask, that, you ask your friend, you say, hey, where did you hear those things from? And you know what they tell you? Well, I heard it from so-and-so. Sound familiar? And then you say, okay, where did that person hear it from? And then they said, well, that person heard it from so-and-so. And then that person heard it from so-and-so. And before you know it, you're talking with your friend, and guess what? You come to the conclusion that your friend was only hearing and feeling things that they felt was true. Then they formed a conclusion that wasn't true and started criticizing that person that you know. And oftentimes... Not only do, do we encounter that situation with our friend, but often we have done that. We have heard something. We have felt something that we believe to be true. Then we form a conclusion and start gossiping and criticizing someone else without verifying the facts first about that person or the story. But one thing about an ignorant fool, they're open to correction. After they have been enlightened with the facts, they're open to correction. They're willing to change their perspective and even apologize to the person who they were attacking. The second kind of fool is an obstinate fool. An obstinate fool. This is the kind of fool that you might have encountered in your life. This is the kind of fool who doesn't want to listen to anything you have to say. They're not open to correction. They resist anybody else's perspective because they believe what they are doing is right. We must stay away from obstinate fools. Not saying we can't pray for them or love them or encourage them, but we must stay away from them because they are very divisive. And the third category of people who often criticize are evil people. And I know you're probably thinking, Pastor, well, we're all evil. We all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. And that is true. Absolutely, the Bible says that. But we're talking about evil people in the sense that they make it their life's mission to make people's life miserable. I know you have dealt with people like that because I have. And so, once again, the evil person, they are bent on making people's life miserable. They are bent on just walking in a life that is in opposition to God and they are bent on spitting venom as much as possible. The evil person, these people love to criticize others all day long. They love to dis distort and they love to create division among people. They love to criticize in the morning. They love to criticize in the afternoon. They love to criticize at night. They love to criticize family. They love to criticize loved ones. They love to criticize people in the neighborhood. They love to criticize people in the church. And they love to criticize a stranger that's not even thinking about them. They have made it their life's mission to criticize people. So you're probably saying, Pastor, how do we deal with a person like that? Because truth, 
be known as pastor. I got someone like that in my life right now who's criticizing me unjustly. How do we deal with that person? Well, I don't want to give you my recommendation, but I want to give you what the Bible has to say. Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, it says, Warn a divisive person and warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful, and they are self-condemned. I want to give you a brief review of what we looked at so far. When you are facing criticism, take it through a few filters before you respond. One, what is the target of the criticism? Two, consider the source of the criticism. And now here's the third thing you need to do. When you are being criticized, take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I know, I know, I know it is easy to just retaliate when someone criticizes you, especially if it's destructive criticism. And destructive criticism is when someone is tearing you down without a just cause. They are not offering constructive criticism in a way to help you in whatever area in your life. They are there to make your life miserable with venom, spitting venom out of their mouth. And so I know you want to say something back, but it's not worth it. But instead, take that to the Lord in prayer. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Listen here. Nehemiah, once again, Nehemiah, he dealt with criticism. You deal with, you and I deal with it today, but he dealt with it in his day. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. He says, hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as a plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So here we can see one thing in this prayer. Nehemiah is upset. He is upset upset he's i mean i mean look at this he says do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight for their insult for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders in other words he's saying god don't cover up their guilt don't blot out their sins lord we, lord we want you to deal with them because they keep throwing insults at us and we've done nothing to them their criticisms their criticisms are unwarranted i know you and i have dealt with people in our life who criticize us in the form of destructive criticism, and it's not even warranted. It's not even warranted. They're not even trying to help us out. We can clearly see they're trying to tear us down, and that's what Nehemiah says here. But this is not the pattern prayer we should pray. Nehemiah, we can see he was very upset here. But the pattern of prayer we should pray is in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, and that's the Lord's Prayer. The pattern of prayer that we should pray is that we love our enemies, we pray for them, we do good to those who try to harm us, not only physically, but also uh, when it comes to verbal abuse. Nehemiah chapter, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9. And this is what Nehemiah did. He says, and we prayed to God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. So Nehemiah is saying not only do we have people who can literally protect us physically on the wall, but we couple that up with prayer. And beloved, today I want to encourage you that prayer is not the least thing you can do. It's the best thing you can do. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Listen to this. This is dealing with Moses. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded they camped at Refudim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink, Mo give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And so like I said earlier in this message, we see that the children of Israel, they love criticizing Moses. Every chance they can get, they question his leadership and they criticized it. And I, one of the things I want to let you know is that if you've ever just been on the job and you've been assigned as a leader and you, and, 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 and you were taking the, the job or company or people in a direction that they wasn't really comfortable with and you received criticism for that. And here we see Moses the same way, being criticized. But Moses doesn't retaliate with, I'm tired of you people, get away from me, you're on your own, find your next leader. 
No, what he does is he takes that criticism and he takes it to the Lord in prayer. He prays. He says, Lord, I don't know what to do. These people look like they're getting ready to kill me. You have an answer. Provide me the answer. Hezekiah, same way. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 14. Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. So, beloved, I would encourage you in your own personal time, when you get a chance, read 2 Kings chapter 18 and chapter 19 to get the full context here. But I'll provide it for you just in a, brief, in a, in a few brief sentences. What we have here is that Rebbe Shekah, he was the king of Assyria, and he wanted to destroy God's people. And so what he did to uh, threaten them and to get them to be afraid is that he leveled a lot of uh, insults and blasphemies and lies and taunts. And he tried to shake the confidence of the people back then. And also he tried to shake the confidence of Hezekiah. And in that letter that Hezekiah received from his messengers, it was a letter full of uh, uh, mocking and criticism and ridicule and boast and lies and blasphemies. And what Hezekiah did is he did not write a letter in response back to King Rebbesheikah. What he did is he took that letter, he went to the temple, he spread it out on the floor, and he prayed to God. Respond to criticism with prayer. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7 confirms this. It says, cast all your anxiety unto him because he cares for you. Beloved, that word anxiety means worry, concern. And guess what? People's criticism of us, especially if it's unjust, makes us worry and concerned. So take that to the Lord in prayer. Be careful with two things, beloved. Be careful with criticism because criticism can deflate you. But also be careful with praise, because praise can inflate you. Take criticism and praise to the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. Nehemiah says this to the people because they were concerned with the criticism. He says, after I looked these things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. In other words, Nehemiah is saying, I understand that Sanballat and Tobiah and all those folk, they are criticizing us. They are hating on us. They don't want us to finish this work. But he says, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the wall. Fight for your families. Fight for your sons and your wives and your daughters. Fight. We have to fight. And so I would encourage you today, beloved, to keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't listen. Don't entertain destructive criticism from the enemy. Keep your hand to the plow. So, once again, for review, whenever you're facing criticism, one, ask yourself what is the target of the criticism. Two, consider the source of the criticism. Three, when you're being criticized, take it to the Lord in prayer. And four, continue to keep working in spite of criticism. Oh, I know that's hard to do. That's hard to do because you want to stop in that moment and give that person a piece of your mind. But if you are a child of God, you can't do that. You can't do that. You have to keep working in spite of the criticism, whether it's constructive or destructive. Nehemiah had three alternatives that he could have taken when he was being criticized. First, he could have given up. How many of you ever felt like giving up? I can't see your hand, but I know you're nodding. You felt like giving up sometimes, but you got to stay in. Secondly, he could have left the wall and left a preemptive strike. And that simply means he could have told the people, you know what, let's put down our tools for now and let's give it to Sam Ballot and the rest of them. Let's show up. Let's show them how we can get this done. Let's fight. But no, we don't, we don't, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers in high places. And three, he could have continued to build the wall, and armed him and the people defensively. And that's what he did. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. It says, so we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And so here's the thing that Nehemiah understood, and this is what he understood. 
Nehemiah avoided a common mistake associated with criticism, and it is this. He didn't allow the enemy to become the focus of his attention. Did you hear that? Nehemiah did not allow the enemy to become the focus of his attention. In other words, Nehemiah had his eyes set on what God told him to do despite the criticism. And there's times in life where God will call you to do something for him and people won't really understand. Or he may call a church to do something that people don't understand. But here's the thing. Whatever God has called you to do in life for his glory Even in the face of criticism, you must continue to keep your hands to the plow. And as simply as I mean when it comes to this by mission, we all are called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. No matter what our profession is, we can share the gospel through our profession. But there's people who are going to mock us and ridicule us and heckle us because we share the gospel, because we walk with with Jesus. But we can't let that deter us. we got to keep our hands on the plow just like Nehemiah did with him and his people on the wall. And so, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 18. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 18. And each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So Nehemiah said, well, in case these guys want to come up and start some trouble, we'll make sure we're armed defensively, but we're going to keep ourselves on the wall. Beloved, In life, you can't spend all your time putting fires out and never getting the job done. We're not called in life to put all the fires out. We're called to trust in Jesus and allow him to work in us to accomplish our mission. And so what I'm basically saying is we should not major in minors. We need to major in majors. And the major is to be conformed to the likeness of Christ, to grow in Christ, even in the face of destructive criticism. Don't let criticism distract you. Learn to expect it because it's here to stay. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 19 through 23. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 19, 19 through 23. It says, And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, The work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. And the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we are labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at, at, this, at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who follow me, none of us took off our clothes, each kept his weapon at his right hand. That is commitment to what God has called Nehemiah to do. They stayed on that wall until it was completed. And so I encourage you today to stay on the wall until it is completed. Whatever that wall is in your life, whatever that post God has assigned you to, whatever that assignment he has called you to, stay there until it is finished. I want to end by giving you a few famous people who face criticism in their life. One group you may know of and you probably listened to before, the Beatles. The Beatles were rejected by a record label after record label. And one notable response was said by the Beatles and uh, that was said about the Beatles was that guitar groups are on the way out and the Beatles have no future in show business. We know that is not true because the Beatles are one of the most famous music bands in the history of music. Winston Churchill's father said that Winston was unfit for career in law or politics. We know that's not true because look how that turned out. Barbara Strahan's mother says she'd never be a singer because her voice wasn't good enough and she'd never be pretty enough to be an actress. You know, I got to stop right there because there are some times in life where there will be people, even in your family, who will criticize you. Your mom and your dad, your brother or your sister, and that's often where it hurts the most. People who are close to you shouldn't say those things about you. Muggsy Bogues received negative feedback from his peers on the game of basketball. They said he is wasting his time. He never played professional basketball. And beloved, this one resonates with me because I am a sports fan. I love watching basketball, the National Basketball Association in particular. And what's interesting about this is Muggsy Bogues was five foot three. 
And the reason why he received this negative feedback in terms of him never playing professional basketball and why some believe he couldn't do it is because in the NBA, it's a tall man's game. Now, there are some exceptions of players who are six foot, six foot one, six foot two, six foot three, and we would consider that tall in society. But in the NBA, that's short. Most players in the NBA are six five and taller, and Muggsy Bogues made it in the NBA five foot three. And he had a 14 year career in the NBA at five foot three, playing in a tall man's game. But if he would have listened to the criticism, he never would have got to where he made it. Henry Morton, the president of the Stevens Institute of Technology, commented about Thomas Edison's light bulb. Thomas Edison was criticized because of the light bulb. Listen to this. Everyone acquainted with the subject will recognize it is a conspicuous failure. We know that's not true because I'm preaching in the church right now and the light bulbs are on. You're sitting in the church right now and the light bulbs are on. You're sitting at your home right now and the light bulbs are on. Beloved, if Thomas Edison would have listened to this guy here, will we have lights today? Will we have light bulbs today? In a famous rejection letter, Rudy Yard Kipling was told by the San Francisco Examiner, I'm sorry, Mr. Kipling, but you just don't know how to use the English language. Another form of negative criticism. Henry Ford was told that the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty or a fad. Beloved, I don't know about you today, but I don't see a lot of people traveling by horse today. Maybe in some states it's true, but mostly we see in our world today people are traveling by plane or car or by boat, not so much by horse. Horse is more of something to enjoy riding, but not so much traveling like they did back in those days. But no, had Henry Ford listened to this criticism, would we have cars today? Maybe not. The final proof, this is by Elver Hubbard. He says, the final proof of greatness lies in being able to, to endure criticism without resentment. Can you endure even destructive criticism without resentment? That's hard, because if someone says something about you and it's not true and it's way off base, can you handle that without being bitter? Can you handle that without resentment? Can you handle that and still love them like God has called you to love them? And so today, beloved, I want to simply encourage you to press forward. Wherever God has called you to work, wherever he's called you to serve, beloved, I want you to press forward. Be like Nehemiah. Keep your hand on the wall. In the face of constructive criticism, and definitely in the face of destructive criticism. Let us pray today. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you that we can uh, have access to your word through internet, more specifically YouTube. Bless your people today, and may they be changed by this word. Amen. God bless you.